May and the Watergate break-in, once described by the White House as a third-rate burglary attempt, is now the object of a nationally televised Senate investigation. We will inquire into every fact and follow every lead, unrestrained by any fear of where that lead might ultimately take us. Bible-quoting Senator Sam Irvin wraps the opening gavel, and in the next several weeks, his patented, uncontrolled eyebrows become as much an attraction to television viewers as the affair a day doctors on the soap operas being preempted. Former presidential counsel John Dean is the first witness to directly implicate the president in the alleged cover-up. Dean testifies he once advised Mr. Nixon that a cancer was growing on the presidency and that if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. Watergate prompts several persons to leave, both the White House staff and the presidential campaign staff. Some quit, others are fired, some are indicted, others are already in jail. This list merely covers the more notable personalities caught up in Watergate. A special prosecutor is appointed, presidential tapes disclosed, an attorney general, his deputy attorney general, and the prosecutor all out of jobs in a dispute over the acquisition of those tapes. Then a few crucial tapes are missing. Parts of another are inaudible. Rosemary's boo-boo becomes the in-joke among those disbelieving that the president's secretary could have accidentally erased a part of the tape. With the pressure mounting on the White House to open up, the man who only a year earlier won a landslide mandate to return to office now launches a campaign to remain in office. A part of it is appearance before the Associated Press Managing Editors Convention, Disney World. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. The motion has been made that the rules be suspended and that a unanimous vote be cast for the... Spiro Agnew, nominated for vice president in 1968. Agnew. If there was anything at all the president did not need in 1973, it was a scandal in the second highest office in the land. But a grand jury digs into reports of a kickback scheme in Maryland while Agnew was governor of that state. Agnew resigns and pleads no contest to a single count of tax evasion. He is fined $10,000 and placed on three years probation. Spiro Agnew, a unique story of the rise and fall of a vice president. I am denying them outright, and I'm labeling them, and I think a person in my position at a time like this might be permitted this departure from normal language as damned lies. The reason that I have changed my decision to fight this matter is because that I believe it would be against the national interest to have a brutalizing effect on my family to go through a long two-year struggle concerning this matter. You also may be aware of what I said in open court, that I categorically and flatly deny the assertions that have been made by the prosecutors with regard to their contentions of bribery and extortion on my part. The government at Washington does live. It lives in the pages of our Constitution, and in the hearts of our citizens. And there it will always be safe. Thank you, good night, and farewell. Our distinguished guests and our, my fellow Americans, I proudly present to you the man whose name I will submit to the Congress of the United States for confirmation as the Vice President of the United States, Congressman Gerald Ford of Michigan.